you've got a chat function and on both of those platforms we can take any questions you like as we go and we really encourage you to get involved in the session unlike an orchestra rehearsal please do interrupt so today's guest our final guest is the conductor Marin Alsop who I know needs no introduction but one thing I will say is that she is one of the few conductors alive used to holding down orchestra positions in three continents. Also interestingly on her website, I see it says conductor, mentor, innovator, and leader. Welcome, Marin. I'm here. Hi. Good morning. Hi, Marin. Great Good to see you. Good morning from my from my. Good morning from your end. Yeah, yeah, thanks for joining us at what is a reasonably early time for you. I I know in in the U.S. Yes, no, my pleasure to be here. So my first question, Marin, is just tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in the last few months during this uh, crisis of ours. Um. Well. You know, I think like everybody, um, it was a, it took a little bit of time to actually um, grasp the gravity of the situation. And it really, I would say it took me a good, uh, probably six weeks to realize that, that this was going to be an ongoing situation. And, you know, at first, I think probably like everyone, I ran around and tried to get a lot done. And then, you know, there are different stages, I think, for all of us. And then it was very hard to get motivated for a certain period of it and, and all kinds of things like that. But most importantly, I've really tried to um, take the time to be introspective and to think not only about music, but the role of music in the world, how we want to look at a future um, in the arts, what the arts can do to lead our 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 humanity forward. Um, you know, then specifically, I've had to teach conducting online, a lot of that. I've been working on a virtual reality headset for um, conductors so that they can simulate practicing with the orchestra. So that's been a lot of fun. And, you know, trying to actually do a lot of outreach to people um, that I haven't been able to schedule in, you know, lots of talks, um, lots of discussions with, with great artists. My, my dear friend Bernard Heitink has done several talks for me, with me. So things like that, Marshall, you know, but I would say that, um, that this is a defining time. I, it must be very difficult to be young in this moment. I, I understand, you know, when you're on a trajectory and then suddenly uh, a big door is closed in front of you, um, it, it may be, uh, you know, it may feel Suddenly. as though you are just um, up against insurmountable odds. But I would say it, this is a moment of opportunity and transformation, and we need to seize this moment. Thanks very much, Marion. Actually, for anybody listening in, I want to say that Marion and I are both battling a very, very interesting echo. So we're, we're listening to each other talking at, at different times, but we're trying to make the best of it. Um, so, you know, that's fascinating to hear. And I wonder, you know, my big question actually is what, what do you see in the future? Because we all know that we're still in a very strange period of this whole pandemic. Um, things will happen in the next few months. At some point, hopefully, there'll be a vaccine. We will get back to, to use the cliche, everybody's using the new normal. And uh, the question I think that's really interesting is what, what changes do you really think there'll be in the way that music is done and made that we'll stick and keep with, even when we're not all worrying about face masks and getting a vaccination? Well, I think there, I think there are two dimensions to your question. One is a, a, a philosophical um, thought, and maybe I'll start there because um, I think, you know, seeing this time combined also with um, a real a real effort to combat um, uh, racism, elitism, um, inequity. I think it's not accidental that this is all coming together at this moment. And I would say that in terms of 
the art world and particularly music since that's the world we know um, this is a moment to really change the focus and create you know push the doors wide open so that everyone can participate so that it's a huge embrace that's what it should be anyway um, so I think I think that we could really change the whole way we measure what we do if it's you know instead of well measuring is a an issue anyway for me in art you know I think perfection we're all striving for this unattainable perfection and I would say let's let that go let's be the best we can be of course but instead why don't we why don't we strive for um, embrace and inclusion and real diversity in our field um, you know, in terms of players, in terms of audience, in terms of composers, in terms of experience, um, that we're not just stuck playing the same little swath of music, you know, from Haydn to Stravinsky, basically, and for the same very limited number of patrons. I mean, this this harkens back really to to the the you know the 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 aristocracy in in the old days, and and it's time to move forward and create a more equitable and I think egalitarian future. I think we have that chance. So I would say that um, that's my great hope for the future. And um, that's what I would, you know, rely on young people, especially to, to really try to um, try to push that agenda forward. This is really interesting. So, I mean, first of all, a lot of what you're talking about, I mean, I'm used to talk about social justice. And I think, you know, the, the idea that, I mean, this has been, this has been going on for a long time, hasn't it? I mean, you know, it's been dripping on in bits of our profession for a hell of a long time. And now what you're maybe saying, I, I, you know, I think this is an interesting idea that, that we're maybe reaching a tipping point with this crisis and that maybe that kind of issue is not going away from the mainstream and that we just need to I get used so. to it. Yeah, I, I hope so. You know what? Of course, what we see in the world. I mean, just look at our our government here in the United States. You know, we went from Barack Obama to Donald Trump. You know, so you move forward and then you move way back. You know, this is it's sort of a, a it's it's a reaction. Um, so I would say that what we have to battle now is the people who want to hang on to the system. You know, the people for whom it it was profitable and um, their own private club. We have to now really say, you know, we want you as part of this, but we want to expand the walls. We want, you know, I'm thinking that when we look at building concert halls, maybe we want to look at a completely different model. Not this everyone sits and, and passively listens. Maybe it's something much more interactive. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that this is a moment where all of these ideas could finally come to fruition and and all come together uh, as you say you know we've been we've been sort of nibbling around this edge of diversity and i think for most institutions while it's genuine it's reluctant you know and it's awkward and instead i would say look why don't we just i'm not very good at diving but i'll give it a try let's dive in and we'll make mistakes but if we if we don't commit um, as an industry and as each institution, I'm not sure we will make progress, you know, because progress is incremental. In order to play a musical instrument at the level of your musicians, for example, Mark Marshall, they have to they have to begin as 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 you all did that are listening when you're, you know, four or five, six years old often. And people without economic means do not have the luxury of access. So we have to really go back and, and start that. And I rely on young people to be mentors and to set a pathway for these younger people. You know, even if you, even if you, each of you took one kid who was interested in music and taught them your instrument, I mean, can you imagine in 20 years what that would, due to the industry amazing 
Yeah, no, I think that's all. That is extremely interesting. I mean, again, I was looking on your website. You you put yourself down as a mentor, but actually, it seems to me one of the things you're saying is that we adults, we adults. That's a terrible phrase. <laughs> An old person like you me, mean old people? Think of yeah, my, I think safe. So. Think I need to think of myself as being taught by some of these younger people as well, because I there is. I mean, I can feel this. There is a kind of change in, yeah, in the way that that. That players, you know, the, the old—I'm sorry, I'm going to use his name—but the old carry-on idea of the the kind of the, the kind of the Moses who's come down from the mountain with the tablets, and and thinking about, you know, I know, I, I mean, I see when you work with the orchestra and with other conductors these days, there's a kind of openness. So, I mean, should younger players be demanding more of that? Is is this a a thing where people can wait, where young players can wait for change, or should they be pushing for change? Oh, but you know the answer, and they all know the answer. I mean, it, there's, it, if you wait for change, it never comes. I mean, you have to be agents of change. And I think that art is an incredible social vehicle for change um, if we use it in, in the right way. I mean, I just think of, um, you know, I think of this Beethoven year, and, and not to digress too much, but here we are. Um, I thought the defining feature of 2020 would be that it's Beethoven's 250th anniversary. Who knew that would be, you know, sort of a, 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 a footnote. But I think of him as a composer who overcame so much personal struggle and yet retained this incredible optimism and intense belief in the power of unity um, through joy, of course, as we know. And when I look at something like Fidelio, um, I had planned to open my last season in Baltimore. Of course, it's canceled now, but with a um, basically a, a Black Lives Matter uh, version of Fidelio, because the issues are the same issues we're confronting today of unjust imprisonment, you know, incarceration for people who really should not be there whatsoever. So, you know, I think there are ways to use our our tools, even going back that far to Beethoven, to to bring them into the spotlight and to to f enable them to be relevant for today and get the, our message across. Yeah, th that reminds me a little bit of, uh, of course, you have a Beethoven project this year, and you know, obviously, you planned it way ahead, so not a, not during coronavirus. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you wanted to, uh, what the project is, what you wanted to achieve with it. And also, one of the things I've obviously realized, you know, we've seen is is the need to adapt in the current crisis. And, and so what kind of adaptation have you had to make to the project? Well, of course, we, the EUIO was part of the um, initial kickoff, which was so wonderful. And I loved working with the orchestra at the World Economic Forum, along with the um, my incredible choir from Sao Paulo. Um, so the idea, of course, um, for all of those that participated, you probably got the gist of it anyway, was to re <clears throat> reimagine uh, particularly the text for a 21st century um, audience of listeners and try to create um, a connection with the piece as an entity. So the first note begins and it's a journey for people. And the journey, the message of the journey um, really is around these themes of unity, tolerance, peace, joy, humanity toward others. And so the plan um, in place was to perform it on six different continents. Only Antarctica was the only one I wasn't going to, um, with uh, um, 10 different organizations and have a new text in the various languages. When we were uh, scheduled to do it in Baltimore, uh, I had a rap artist here do a new text. And um, in uh, in Africa, a, 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 po a poet wrote a new text in Zulu. So the language speaks directly to the people experiencing the piece. And then I was um, weaving in uh, other music in between the movements to make the connections and to bring it um, culturally home for the listeners. And so of course, we, we launched it in Sao Paulo and then the World Economic Forum and then everything was canceled. So we've, but you know, people feel so strongly about this project um, 
that we've rescheduled quite a few of them. Um, Beijing rescheduled and uh, Baltimore rescheduled and New Zealand rescheduled. So the project will continue um, and we're doing a huge online iteration of it, um, working with YouTube and Google now. So I think, you know, hopefully you'll all participate in it um, eventually and in some way. Uh, but, but the idea is to get this message of together we can achieve greatness across to the entire globe instead of this sense of being siloed you know this country's doing well that country's doing poorly you know come on let's come together as a human race oh, i think you're muted marshall sorry yeah, let me yeah. unmute myself yeah. then people here um by the way if anybody has any questions they want to put or any comments do throw those into the chat at the moment and we're very happy to to deal with those um, I mean, it's fascinating hearing your take on all of this, Marin. I mean, you're presumably not then one of these people who feels that in the future, you know, touring is going to die or um, the way normal concerts happen. I mean, do you think do you think that's well, we're making our way back to that kind of thing or not? I don't know. You know, uh, to me, tradition is really the last bad idea. I I have no interest in going backward. I have only interest in moving forward, and I think that um, I think that uh, we have a chance now to reinvent the concert experience for people. You know, this idea of spacing on stage. You know, when I try to move my musicians occasionally around, they're so resistant. Well, get with the program. It's a new age. You know, we can. We can experiment with that. Maybe we can experiment with how we how we set up the audience so that they can be participants in the experience. You know, there's a lot that can happen within this idea of social distancing and all kinds of things. So, I mean, I don't know that I, I don't know that I don't want um, my old life back because I loved it so much. But I think I think we have to let go of those ideas. Instead of trying to get back to something, let's move forward to something new. And and we'll try things and some things will work and some things won't work. But, you know, I think it's I think it's a fantastic moment of opportunity. And maybe being, you know, being uh, uh, on, with only a handful of women for so many years, you know, I understand that every crisis is an opportunity for us because that's how I had to build my own career. You know, seizing a moment and saying, okay, let's try this. And I think, you know, for me, this just seems like another another um, version. It's a theme in variations. Yeah, so actually, I think there's a really interesting area here, which is uh, this notion of actually every crisis is an opportunity. Let's just look at the opportunities now. Um, I was just thinking also that there are inspirations from the past for us as well. I, I was, I was remembering when I, you know, when I've been in Japan and I'd been to see Kabuki theatre, and the way in which the audience is absolutely connected with what's going on on stage. And in fact, there are these guys, there are these people who have a role. They're callers, so you get to a kind of pregnant moment in the drama, and they will call out the family name of the of the actor, and there's a kind of connection between you know, what's happening on the stage and what's happening in the audience. It's the same thing. And, you know, I think you're, pr I'm just thinking about this for the first time as you're saying, you know, what did you say? Tradition is the last thing we should be thinking about at the moment. And maybe that's no, it. Tradition you know. is the last bad idea. It's the last bad idea. I'm going to write that down. Actually. Um, <laughs> Don't and I, you know, maybe that's it. Now, I'm sure you're right. So many of us are, um, we're, we're kind of, um, it's, it's a thing we can't do without it. So let's just throw that out. We've certainly experimented in the last few years, the orchestra, with different configurations for concerts. And that is that is fascinating. Um, you know, I'm even thinking back to Greek theatre, you know, the way that people are placed around. I, and it's great. I, I feel when you go into certain concert halls that, that, that do that. So the encouragement, one of the encouragements you're giving is to players and say, actually, take hold of this, guys. Use the change, make the change, do something on the stage which helps helps that that change. Um, and I think we we need a new kind of um, we need a kind of archive of new ideas of ways to change around the stage. I 
I remember reading a, an article by uh, Alex Ross. Um, I think it was called something like Close Up. And I tried to use that as a series. So we now do close up concerts where we say, how near can the audience get? Well, actually, they can be in the orchestra. So now we put seats uh, of a different color inside where the orchestra is and anybody from the audience can come and sit there. So I guess, you know, it's that kind of experimenting, which we just need, we need to make a stretto out of that. We need to do more of it and more quickly. Absolutely, much more. And also now that we've opened up this whole world of online experience, I think we need to integrate this, um, this medium into what we're doing as well. So that, for example, if I'm, if I'm isolated at home, but I want to come and sit in the orchestra with you, why can't I? So I think we need to start thinking about how we can create those possibilities for people. And, and of course, also offer, offer music education. You know, I'm, I don't mean that in terms of a very um, specified and detailed, but I think general music education we need to offer to people. You know, when we think about to, I, I'll go back to Beethoven again, just because he's on, on my mind these days. When we think about the premiere of the Seventh Symphony and the audience's understanding of the piece and, and demanding that the, the slow movement be um, reprised, you know, that's, that's something that, I, I love when my audience reacts, whether it's, you know, I remember uh, at the Wien Modern when, when we opened the season, there was one piece, the audience was booing. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I, you know, I thought it was fantastic because there's an opinion. But when people don't, don't feel entitled to an opinion, they don't express it. So I would say that we could also do a lot of um, music education, you know, I'd say for young people, if you got together and maybe once a month or once a week, you know, did kind of a music 101 for people, for other young people, um, because a lot of times I think we as artists feel alienated from the rest of the population. You know, it's such an, it's such a niche. It's such an elite, whoop, oh, okay. Um, such an elite group that, and, and experience that we're having, but let's try to share that. That's my feeling. That's really interesting. And you remind me, actually, of a concert I saw in London, which you were conducting uh, with Sao Paulo Symphony. And um, there was, at the beginning of the concert, it was Berio Symphonia. Symphonia and it was part of a, uh, the Rest is Noise series at Southbank Centre, which was recreating a little bit that march through the 20th century of music and, and the most extraordinary thing happened which you you couldn't plan which was there was a demonstration because the the concerts was were were sponsored by shell and there was a demonstration by some people who came on who were in the audience and they started singing at the beginning of the concert and some of the players in your brazilian orchestra in the in the in the, the, the orchestra palace said said to me afterwards they said my god that's amazing i'd never thought of planning that and of course that's a really good example of where okay that was a random event but but maybe we should be uh thinking more about those kinds of things oh definitely and what about what about as you you suggested uh, on the model of the kabuki theater what about if people are are um positioned you know to start reacting or to start singing or to start clapping or to start engaging. I, I think there's a lot of room um, without without ever um, disparaging or denigrating the art form. You know, that I, I hold that sort of sacrosanct and I wouldn't ever want to do anything to uh, to diminish what we do. But I think there's still a lot of room for uh, additional um, experiences and especially I think we've done an, a disservice to our audiences by not not really bringing them into the experience of the live concert yeah now that that is interesting I mean obviously we have to keep that respect for the audience and uh, it you know again reminds me I used to I used to do uh, concerts with Roger Norrington playing for him where he, he would tell the audience, you, you know, you're free to clap. You, you should be able to clap between movements. The problem was that one rule, the modern rule, that you don't clap between movements, got replaced with another rule, which is 
you should clap between movements. And so it's not natural. And I, you know, I was thinking, I think a long time ago, I saw it in this book by, um, uh, about called Listening in Paris, is it James Johnson. He talked about the fact that he'd found a rule book from, I don't know, 1810, 1815, which was the first thing he'd ever seen, which was a book that tells audiences how to behave. What are the rules? And I think what you're talking about is we need to free the audience, first of all, to actually listen to their own listening and react with that, not right. with any rules anybody else gives them. Yeah, and it's such, such an empowering, you know, when you go to a concert or say when we go to a play and we have a, a visceral reaction, you know, it, it's it's an empowering experience, right? And you share with your friends, ah, I had this incredible experience at this play the other night or whatever it is, or I, I saw this artwork that moved me so much, or I really hated that exhibit. You know, I think it's all valid and it should all be entertained. I, I don't think we should go from no clapping to now you clap, you know, because we're missing the the journey part. It has to, it has to be accompanied with some kind of, sense of um knowledge i wouldn't I, education might be too strong but a sense that people are entitled to their opinions and they're really developing an opi an opinion as the music is happening it's 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 a lie it's it's the audience being able to have that live reaction i'm just wondering with our own audience if anybody's having any reactions about this because i know this can be a very contentious matter you know how should the audience how can the audience behave um and it, it's, it's such an interesting question this uh, how when you're as a conductor or as a player i mean how do you how do you think when you go on stage how do you give help give the audience that comfort that they can be themselves and react in their own ways yeah i mean i think that's uh you know i often say a few words as you know um yeah. particularly if it's a new piece um and i think that breaks down the fourth wall to to start but even when i don't i try to i try to really um at least feel the audience there and not ignore them and not put up a barrier of any kind um I, you know it's it's not at the front of my mind, of course, when I'm conducting the musicians and the music are, are first and foremost. But I think, I think the, that my audience usually feels, um, I hope they do anyway, relaxed and, and entitled. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's, that's the case. Yeah. Um, just moving into one question, because you talked a little bit about, you know, what technology can do. Um, you know, are, what are your ways that you're thinking now about about how you want to try and um, use technology, but as this positive, form? not as, you know, how it can become a trap, can't it? I often remember those operas I used to play in where there was always a piece of technology that it just got in the way in the end. There was always a problem with it. So I'm just wondering what you see as the kind of the positive uh, routes that you can take with this? Maybe for me, I, the, the big takeaway in terms of technology from this, um, from this experience of isolation has been, it's the same, I guess, as what I hope for the future. It's about access. I think, you know, we can use technology to really create, um, create entry points for people into understanding what the orchestra does, into understanding what you all do as musicians. I mean, I think it would be fascinating to do some kind of diary about, you know, what what kind of commitment goes into being a violinist. I mean, I don't think people have any idea really what is involved and even the 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 issues of, you know, the athletic the athleticism involved, you know, the the use of your muscles, how you have to take care of things. You know, I I think that uh, especially for young people, if you could start to um, maybe put out some small videos educating people about about your journey and why you love music, you know, what is it that drew you in? Um, these stories are fascinating, you know, it's the personal element. And then, of course, 
you know, you can create, once you create relationships, you bring the people along with you to the rehearsal, you know, you say, well, if you're interested in that, how about, um, how about coming to the rehearsal with me later? You know, here's the link. I, I just think there's a whole access that, that has opened up or that we maybe was there and we weren't, we weren't open to it. Um, yeah. I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that um, professional orchestras will, will seize the opportunity and not put up more barriers. Barriers, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I have to say my experience with the, the EUIO is that, you know, the great thing is this generation, I'm talking about musicians mainly in their early mid-twenties, there is an openness. There's an openness to trying it. So, look, we have a question, an interesting question coming from Agnese. And maybe we can put that one up. Would you have some suggestions on how to get our new ideas as young musicians with a lot of different takes on things understood and eventually accepted by people strongly attached to traditions? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say to try to um, try to align yourself with people um, who are in positions of influence and and power so i'm open as you know now i'm open to anything and all new ideas i welcome so if you have a good idea send it my way i'll try to support it you know try to find those people that will help some more support and promote um i think there there are several elements that people love to measure by whether they admit it or not audiences and money are two of them if you can create something that brings new audiences in, then we could start to promote that to people. Or if you can do something that can be, I hate this term, but monetized in some way, then institutions start to become interested in it. Um, I hate to be capitalistic about it, but it's, it's the truth. Um, so I think my advice would be to align yourself with people who have influence and who are supportive and then see if you can try to tick some of those boxes i think that's a really interesting answer there and, and of course you're right i mean you it, this is a question about it's about leverage how do you get leverage in a situation and i i, I really take Agnes's point um and i think you put your, your finger on the two things you know if you can bring in the audience or you can bring in money let's not be shy about this um and and maybe that's so i mean maybe the point is when you say align yourself with these people actually it's probably it's probably going to these people with the ideas yeah no exactly yeah. or or if you have some um uh video of of it you know that brings it to life you know yeah. send it out to a few people and say I, i've got this idea i'd like to try to you know fortunately you have marshall here who's completely open to new ideas and um you know, the crazier, the better, just like me. So, you know, you have someone right in your court, which is very exciting. And I think you have all of your colleagues as well, who are just by the nature of being young, more open, I think, to experimenting. And um, I would take advantage of all of those things. You know, what you could create internally is enormous. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it reminds me of somebody used to say about fundraising. They said um, most orchestras don't realize that their, their greatest potential fundraisers are in the audience. And um, maybe that's the same with players, which is, you know, for management, your, your best ideas are currently sitting somewhere in the brains of some of your young players. Uh, so actually, let, let's make this a live session, actually. I'm I'm now touting for ideas. Uh, if anybody wants to suggest any of these, then, then these two crazies, as Marin describes the two of us, can uh, kind of have a look at these. But I, you know, I think you're right. I mean, our, our festival we're beginning at the moment is a bit like this. We had great excitement in the office in realizing that what we had to do this summer was not trying to bring the orchestra together, but it was to try and leave the orchestra in the countries where those people are and enable them to play locally. And so now we have, you know, what is it, 23 concerts, 31 events in 19 countries, and that's a team in the office who are they, they don't mind going down the crazy path to try something because i mean it seemed insane so i think that's a really a really good idea and i look forward to any of those and i also remember i don't know you you, you must be the same marin that i you know i remember back for example when i was with the orchestra of the age of enlightenment when i took over on the management side there i remember thinking you know what there's there are two parties here 
there's a traditionalist party and there's the reforming party. And as the new chief executive, actually, you know what? My role is to align myself with them, which means giving trust to those people that they know that change can come. So th it's interesting. You're just reminding me that actually that idea of alignment. But I do think they're like parties. It's like in a country, you know? We need within an orchestra those who really believe strongly in this concept of change, um, which is very threatening. You know, if you you know, I, this orchestra holds a great, great tradition, and so you don't want to lose that tradition. So I'm just putting one vote up for tradition, as well as the idea that it's it's the last bad idea. No, I I, I would agree with you. I mean, I think the the trick to success is to push a new agenda while really respecting the existing one. And I, I'm not saying that, you know, everything should be thrown out and all tradition is bad tradition, but I think all tradition should be questioned. Yeah. I, I, I have no doubt about that. Um, and, and you should sit down and say, okay, so just because we've done it this way for 50 years, do we think that that's still the best way forward? Let's analyze yeah. it. And also if you have, if you have a philosophy that you've put forth, I mean, uh, I, I would I would have loved to achieve this here in Baltimore. I, I proposed it to them well over a year ago, but couldn't get any um, couldn't get any traction really. But I wanted to motivate everything we did by um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, rather than you know a, a sort of an artistic level, and. I said, why don't we look at the institution and say, does that serve to diversify what we're doing? And, you know, my other idea to them was, let's make one objective institution-wide. And, you know, for us here in Baltimore, I suggested we try to sell or try to fill every seat at every concert. However, we could do that, you know, maybe reaching out to communities that are underserved, free tickets, try to get sponsors and things, but get everyone involved in it. And, um, but that also, I got, <laughs> I couldn't get much traction. So anyway, um, yeah. you know, the, uh, you know, there, there are moments I think when you, you have to read the writing on the wall too, um, and, you yeah. know, and say, and find, find institutions and find your players and partners who are of like mind. And yeah. that's very important. Yeah, I guess that's a really important thing. I mean, I've had players in the past ask about, you know, players work with the UIO, then they go out. And I've heard players come back and say, geez, I mean, I, I went in to do this thing. You know, everybody seems bored out of their tree. I try and, you know, people kind of look at me. What do you do? So, I mean, there is a, it is a challenge, I think, as you, as you enter into um, an orchestral setting of, of how you react and maybe, one of the, I don't know what you think, you know, maybe one of these things is it's the most difficult thing to do. Should you turn down work? Because actually in the end, it's, it's soul destroying or, I mean, I know this is not a question for you to answer. It's a rhetorical question. It's, it's in us. And I guess it's something that we all have, but you know, um, actually there's a question just coming about this uh, from Emma Croon. She's saying, um, how do you think the balance between being a musician and an entrepreneur should be? Sometimes it feels like the entrepreneur side can take over, especially with learning about fundraising and an economical crisis around the corner and perhaps even with us. So what do you what do you say about that? I mean, how, how, how do you how do you adjudicate that balance? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that, Good question. that's a great question. Yeah, the I think balance is a great word. Um, you know, balance for you will be different than yeah. balance for me. So I think the first important thing is to find your own um, sort of level, you know, find out where you feel, um, you feel satisfied and content with a balance between your music making and your other, you know, it sounds like that's what the issue is. Um, I think that we've become so specialized in a way, you know, if you play the, uh, an instrument, you can't have any ideas. That's all you do. You play the notes on the page and that's it. Be quiet, you know, and, and sometimes musicians take that on 
they say, you know, I, I just do the music. I don't do. I think we need to start thinking about existing in the world together mm -hmm. and how we can be both entrepreneurial and artistic. You know, creativity is not limited to people in the arts. Everyone is creative. So, you know, when when we talk about things like that, I, I, I think we have to remember that every human being is certainly at least born with a huge capacity for creativity, whether it's squelched or not is another issue. And I'm not sure I'm getting to the heart of the question. Maybe Marshall, you could you could speak to it because you've had an incredible career balancing those two things. Yeah, that, that's that is interesting. I mean, it's true. In, in in you know, I had quarter of a century as a as a performer, and then I went on to um, the the management side. And you know, one of the things, well, that was with the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Enlightenment. And one of the things that excited me about that was that I realised I was actually feeding, and I am feeding a different side of myself by by doing what I do. Um, and I think that's part of the answer I would give the thing, which is we shouldn't be thinking that a musician and an entrepreneur are at two ends of the spectrum. And you're either one or you're the other. And it's a little bit like that. You'll remember this, Marin, this debate there used to be about, um, you know, is is the arts, is music, is, is it, is it a, an aesthetic thing on its own or is it an instrumental thing? And I was rejected that as you do one or the other because you need to work with i mean it's what you're saying keep keep those valuable bits of tradition and aesthetic but also let's do something else as well and i think it's the same with this which is how the, the question is not in getting that balance right and, and i think emma you are right it's a question of balance the question is you know what entrepreneurial idea can you give rise to which will excite you as a musician and be attractive to the market i mean that's dead easy to say, but it is nevertheless um, something which, uh, where I think I think the answer is. And you know, but I also think that the the there's an inherent prejudice in our industry that if you do management, you can't be a great musician. Mm -hmm. If you're a great musician, you can't add simple yep. sums. You know, there's this, and I think we need to let go of all of these myths. I mean, it may be true for some people. But I think the most interesting people I meet, the most interesting musicians I meet, are the ones that are engaged, you know, fully in many, many other areas of either their profession or with um, fantastic avocations that they follow, you know, woodworking. These are the people that are really, I think, living. Yeah. And I think if I'm honest, this is the chorus I always hear from musicians like you, where I'm asking this question or the kind of question that Emma's asking and actually the same thing in the end always comes back. I mean, we were talking, I was talking a couple of days ago with Lucas Pyron, who, uh, you know, he runs the music fund. He did his PhD on musicians and music in, in Kinshasa. He's worked in Gaza. He knows that tough end of, of, of culture and life and how music brings value to that. And he is saying the same thing as the kind of great maestros on the podium, which is you've got to start by following your own passion. What interests you in life? Then you can find how you can see ways in which that can become an interesting thing for people. And it's, that's the trick, uh, yeah. I guess, you know, I mean, uh, I see that over and over again. I guess that's, I'm sure you'd agree. That's what, what it is. It's like, know yourself. That's one of the, one of the guests here said, know yourself first. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, so from that point of view, I want to just shift gear a bit here. What, you know, from that point of view, I, I, I don't need names here, but what are the kinds of orchestras then that you real, you really find most stimulating to work with? <laughs> You mean after the EUYO? Of course. Of course. Um, no, but I loved I loved working together. I I, I felt it mm. was really special. Um, and then your old orchestra, the OAE, I yeah. enjoy that very much because it's a much more um, participatory and collegial environment. You know, people make contributions, and yeah. it's so it's interactive. Um, I think in uh, you know my experience, I. 
I, I, I loved absolutely my uh, first time with the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra. For me, um, you know, what often happens is that these orchestras have such reputation and are, are so, um, you know, built up in my mind. And sometimes when I go, I think, ah, you know, it's okay. It's a little bit generic or a little bit ordinary. But I, I felt with um, Leipz in Leipzig that these are musicians that are deeply engaged. I think this is the this is really the key for me. When the musicians are deeply committed, deeply engaged, and deeply satisfied, they are happy yeah. people. I yeah. am looking for joy. I would mm -hmm. rather look for, I would rather work with an orchestra, you know, at a lesser level that is interested in having a joyous experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, any day. Because then you have the potential always for greatness when you're closed down um it's very very hard to find that inspiration yeah i mean but with with Leipzig, do you think I, i'm going to keep coming back to tradition actually but do you do you think that one one of the reasons they might be joyful or content within themselves is that they really do have a tradition and I, I say that because, you know, somebody was talking about the Dresden Orchestra the other day in the same kind of way. And I'm always interested in this. I mean, when I was at the South Bank Centre, I would see all these great orchestras coming in and going out. And it was so interesting that, you know, there are some that kind of, they know who they are and they change. But there is a kind of house style. I even feel that with the EUI, actually. I don't know how it's possible that an orchestra that I don't know what it is every three years is more or less completely changed. Nevertheless, there is a kind of a house style. And so, I, you know, I just want to speak up for tradition of that kind. You see what you okay, say. Okay, listen, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not completely, I'm not completely opposed to tradition. But um, I think that it, it's a very good point um, that the musicians... Uh, in, in Leipzig Gewandhaus, they feel um, they feel valued. Ah. They are valued. They're valued through the centuries, you know. And that yeah. that yeah. respect and that valuation, they build that builds. And also, they they are afforded a variety in their lives. You know, they play orchestral concerts they play chamber music they play you know the Bach cantata series they play the opera you know so there's there's a um there's a menu that is satisfying they're not playing the same 10 pieces every year over and over again you know mm -hmm. there's a there's a sense of i think artistic um satisfaction you know that you're feeding that need that we all have to push ourselves and to do something different. Um, but of course, it, this is an, a perfect example of tradition at its best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that again, I mean, we're back to the word balance here. I mean, it's, it's a balance between the valuable bits of the tradition that are worth, that are really worth a lot. How many, than this how many times has a musician um, come up to you and said, uh, Oh, I'd love to take you on a tour and show you, um, you know, and, and talk to you about Mendelssohn and Bach. And this wonderful bass player took me on a, a whole morning oh, tour. A city it, tour. Yeah, yeah city yeah. tour. You know, because of a sense of pride yeah. and ownership. Yes. You know, I mean, it was really, it, it was so um, impactful for me. Yes, and I mean, I guess that really relates to this thing, which is so difficult for so many um, people, not just musicians today, which is, you know, once upon a time, we were rooted in our communities. And now we have this wonderful global supposed culture. And I guess the, the, the challenge there is that you lose, you lose that. I, I, I'm, I'm always amazed by that with the EUIO, where it's very interesting to me that, you know, players from, uh, you know, Bulgaria, Romania, places like that, they own, they still own their own tradition of music. And, you know, where I come from in the UK, we, we, most of us classical musicians, I'm not saying all by any means, but, you know, quite a lot of us have lost that sense of the community of music we came out from. Even when I used to teach in Venezuela with kids uh, within El Sistema, they would start by learning to sing 
genero songs, you know, which are the songs of the plains, which is the kind of the the kind of DNA heart of of that country. And I suppose that you know, it's interesting to me that you you know, we've been talking about two orchestras, Dresden and Leipzig. They were both part of East Germany, and I wonder, I, I don't know whether there's something about that actually that they have retained those roots. It's about roots, isn't it? The roots that go down. If you lose those, it's so difficult to build them up. And what's interesting to me is that it's really our conversation, I think, has uh, has come to its recapitulation here, um, where we began talking about, um, I think, aspirations for the future, hopes for the future. And I think it, for me, it's all based in community mm. and that sense of really um, building community and allowing everyone into the community. Um, you know, I think that's really important. I think that's, I think you've really hit this conversation's nail on its head, which is exactly what you're saying, that there is that incredible sense of value in the old communities. And now that question about community, I know it's, you know, some people find it an overused word, um, but it's such an important side of what we do and what we will do. And it's, you know, it, it's fascinating. We have this orchestra here of people from 27, 28, soon 27 countries. And actually, I've always wondered, you know, I always think, how can we help those players grow their legs back down into their own culture, to their own places? Because it's one thing to come together and to go onto a stage and you have a kind of relationship with an orchestra. So um, a kind of de-Europeanizing de de the EUIO. I still can't get that word. Maybe that's one of our next things to do. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think... Um... My experience um, uh, w w when we performed in January mm -hmm. was, um, you know, my impression was that uh, the musicians are in touch with why they're doing what they're doing. This is something really critical. Don't ever lose that. You know, I think we have to remember always what an incredible privilege it is to be an artist, to be a musician. Yeah. And... If, if at any point it's no longer a privilege, no longer feels like a privilege, but it feels like a burden, my, my big advice would be do something else. Do not stay stuck. Yeah. Keep moving. Yeah, it's certainly, certainly what I've tried to do. You remind me, I, I was a member of the BBC Symphony Orchestra in the 1970s, my first job. And in the middle of one prom season, after a year and a half, I just became dispirited because I felt it was too much of a job. So I ended up in South America in another world. And I think, of course, that, that's so much easier. It was so much, I have to say, it was so much easier for my generation. I think there are so many more pressures today. But I think you are completely right, which is, I think, one of the reasons the UIO is so successful on stage is that, you know, everyone on that stage is there. They have hunger to kind of do what they're doing at that moment. And, you know, I see in the digital stuff we do that it's fine, but, you know, it's a poor substitute yeah. for being on the stage. That's what they want to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we all want want you to be on stage. I, I <clears throat> again, I, I go back to Beethoven sort of to wrap it up um, to say that, uh, you know, I, I think we can, I think we can reach out globally to each other in a much more effective way and uh as beethoven said you know change the tone it, yeah. it's it's really time to do that so that would be you my should, you should explain just where that phrase change the tone of beethoven's well, comes from so in you know he takes this poem by schiller existing poem but he adds his own phrase to it and essentially you know not these notes not these tones change and and it's it's in essence it, i believe it's saying um it's time to change the tone and that is beethoven's contribution to the text and i find that so um mind-blowing i think it's just yeah. fantastic i have to pay tribute at this point to to the the director of uh europa nostra sneska who uh, I yeah, had please. first heard yeah. that idea. I first heard that idea from not idea, but she told me about that. And of course, I looked at it and I thought, "Wow, that is that is it." Okay, well, I think that's going to be our um, that's going to be our rallying call. So everybody will join in our hashtag yeah. hashtag revolution change okay, so the tone. Hashtag 
change the tone. Thank you so much, Marin. It's been an honor and pleasure to talk to you as always. Yeah, and it's been great, great to be with let's you. Be in touch. And we look forward to meeting with the orchestra new on the stage. Your yes, soon. We're, we're almost ready to talk about Almost ready to talk about quite. Yes. Okay. That's great. Soon. Thank you so much, Marin. That's okay. fantastic. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.